Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Airsoft Tech Podcast. This is a this is the actual episode four, and we've been absent recently because I have been incredibly busy, and the people I've been trying to reach out to to join this podcast have also been incredibly busy. Just school and work and everything that's been going on has just been holding us back. But fear not, we are back for sure now, and we're going to try to be doing these podcasts once a week. And the guest today is actually Ryan Fisher. He is actually going to be joining me as a more of a permanent guest, so not actually a guest, but more of, I guess you could say, a co-host of this of this podcast. So we're going to try to make it interesting, fun, and informative. All right. So for our first topic, we're going to talk about recent builds, the things we've been talking about, uh, the things we've been building, the things we've been teching, the guns we've been working on recently. So I'll let Ryan head this one up first. All right. Um... So recently, probably my two most recent builds, uh, one customer, so I had a customer basically bring me a GMP external set and a bag of parts, and not only the bag, he bought a lot of nice parts, but it was a completely ground up custom build. Um, It went pretty smoothly, a lot of modification and kinks to work out as you always do with these kind of ground up builds because whenever you have two parts of different brands, they don't like to mesh together properly. Um, However, an issue with it we've been having with the stupid hop up, so what the first problem was on me. Um, I didn't realize that the customer wanted the gun in like a rush and I finished flat hopping for him, which is the last thing on the list to do, and I tested it for like five minutes and it worked fine. But because I only was testing it for probably a a mag worth of shots to dial in the hop-up, I didn't realize that the hop-up wheel, it was a GMP hop-up, was actually insanely loose and it would unadjust itself. So the customer got home, he set up his gun, he went to test fire it, and he said after like five shots, the hop just went completely away and he couldn't get it to stay. And it took me forever to figure it out because I was trying to go through and see if I messed up anything, go through my process, and I was like double-checking what I did, and I knew everything was correct, and then it kind of hit me that I told him to just hold the hop-up wheel as he tested, and he said that fixed the problem, so it was just a pain in the butt to then have to ship that all the way back to me and fix it just to put Teflon tape around a hop-up wheel. Yeah, I have a... We'll send it back to him. But um, we, I, I ended up installing a new... The post the hop-up wheel sits on it, tighten it down. However, we were both going to an op together that next weekend, so there wasn't enough time for him to ship me the gun, get it, fix it, and ship it back to him because of shipping time. So what I did is I took a brand new Lonex hop-up, I flat hopped that one for him, I tested that in my 416 and ensure it worked, and I brought that to him, um, I brought that for him to the op. So we get to the op, we go to install it, and he's closing the receiver, and he, I think it was, a, the receiver was caught on something, so he applied more force to um, close them, and all of a sudden, the whatever it was caught on must have snapped away because the receivers jammed together extremely quickly, and he actually broke the post. The um, if you look at at an M4 hop up, has the three dials on it. The one farthest to the right, he snapped it in half, and that's the one that actually moves the arm up and down. So now we had two hop ups that were essentially broken. So I had to kind of um, finagle my way to fix it on the field for him and. I actually ended up super gluing the hop-up together because there's just no way it was staying together with the post snapped in half. And he played with that, but that was a very interesting and annoying customer build that I've been working on, and I might still have to fix it for him again like next weekend because I'm, I don't know if he wants to keep that half-together super glued hop-up in his gun. Um, and I, must, I think Ryan could probably, that probably took a lot of time explaining that little annoying story. I've actually had similar issues, like similar silly uh, over the mail issues where, like, I'll get sent a gun. Like, it's like, well, this isn't a recent build, but it was like one of my first builds I ever did for a customer. He sent me his gun, I worked on it, everything went smoothly. I just, like, one thing I forgot to check was that when you turn the motor plate, it was really loose. Like, the motor adjustment screw was really loose. So, after, say, like 5,000 rounds, the motor height was way off. So the customer, you know, messaged me back and was like, hey, my gun sounds awful and it, you know, lost rate of fire, trigger response is horrible, and just all around sounds unhealthy. So I had, he had to send it back, and I, after like an hour and a half of me trying to figure out what was wrong with it, I noticed the motor screw unadjusts itself when you shoot it. 
So <laughs> it was just a huge pain, and uh, that was like one of my first builds. And I almost was just like, I'm done with teching because this is silly. But uh, I figured it out. So yeah. Yeah. But uh, a most recent build for me, oh goodness, I have a lot. Um, I've been working on an DSG or a DSG. I have an SHS DSG that the customer sent me, and so this is all customer oh. build. I know, boo, oh. boo. Okay. Siege tax. Hear me out on this one. This is actually interesting. <laughs> I've got the siege. I've got the SHS DSG right here, and believe it or not, it is incredibly sturdy feeling. Like I do not. I actually have faith in this thing to hold up to an M170 at like 60 RPS easily. It feels tough, and uh, I mean SHS sector keys are good. I don't have many break. I don't think I've actually ever had an SHS sector gear, you know, physically break down through gearbox yeah. usage. It's always been through like a factory default where like the screws weren't in all the way or like the halves were separated. You know, they've never actually broken down. So the SHS DSG build is something like a M150, 18 to 1 gears, you know, the SHS DSG of course. Um, I believe it's a JG Blue motor, so this should be getting around 42, 43 RPS, which is going to be pretty great on the 11 one volt. But the, mm. the coolest part is, is that it's in a Masada, a Masada uh, ACR. Uh -huh. So it, it's going to take a lot, a lot of work. Um, yeah, the, the um, is it an A and K or is it a Magpul Aries kind of base? Unfortunately, it's the A and K version. Yeah, I actually like working on those a lot better than the Magpul ones. I just, they're just so finicky. They're still really annoying, don't get me wrong, but I think they're they are less annoying than the Magpul ones. I find the, the uh, A and K ones just so finicky. Now, the Magpul yeah, one is I set up, like, the Magpul one fits together easier, in my opinion, like, it's easier to work on, but it's harder to build off of just based on the design and, like, the integrity of the parts that you can't replace due to them being proprietary. Yeah. So that's the biggest downfall with the Magpul version. Yeah, I know. Um, I, I personally own an NK um, Masada actually, and it went through I think three builds in its lifetime until I finally just said screw it and I threw an SMP system in it. That way I don't have to open it up anymore. But it was. <laughs> it's not that. It's not that it couldn't be done. It was just that it was way more annoying than your standard system. Like. And obviously, it's an A and K, so all the stock parts. There's only so much you can really keep reliably. Um, the hot pup is trash. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. There's no other way to say it. Absolutely, it was designed. I, the, the design was fine, but they executed it terribly. Like I remember, I um, the first I, I got it in a trade with a friend, so I was not expecting it to work that like, that well. Anyway, I was expecting to have to fix it, but I remember the hop's clear, so you can see how it works. And with the hop on max, it still didn't protrude into the barrel at all. There was no nub coming down. But, like, you just literally couldn't apply hop. There was no way to. It was, it was the stupidest design. Wow. Um, yeah, I I haven't actually you know digged into the hop unit on this one. So, you know, it's been a long time since I've looked at one, but I haven't digged into this one specifically. And so I need to take a look at it and probably do some modifications to get it to work. Because this mm -hmm. customer, like... I feel like he doesn't have the greatest budget, and that's how a lot of airsofters are nowadays. So it's you know, yeah. not a much, not much of a problem. But uh, I hate doing builds on a budget because when problems arise, cheap fixes just cause breakdowns. Honestly, so yeah, it's, it's it's like when you're renovating a house when you go to fix the fix the basement, and you realize there's a water leak. Like you have to fix that. So now your low budget becomes even lower, and there's not really much you can do about it. Yeah, when like a pipe breaks down and has a hole in it. You can't put duct tape over it. You need exactly. to replace the you, you, you need to replace to the pipe. The exactly. And so I'm afraid this build's going to cost a little more than what the customer's comfortable with, but it's going to be an awesome build none, nonetheless. <laughs> so, all right. So that's our uh, topic of recent builds. That's like about a 10 minute of our discussion there. We could probably go over that a lot more, probably for an hour if we wanted to, just talking yeah. about our builds and it's everything incredible. about them. Because you know, an hour's talk with the time in a build is, you know, just touching the surface, to be honest, because there's so much that goes into it. But uh, we'll move on and spare you the uh, headache to a short product review. We're going to be talking about the Lonex Red Piston today. Now, I'll let you take this one, Ryan, because you, you let me start in the previous. Right, all right. So I've got the Lonex Red Piston in my hands right now, and it has seen a lot of wear, actually. This was the first piston I used in my first DSG, my first personal DSG, 
and that was an M170 build at 50 RPS. So it's holding up pretty great still. I actually like this piston. Um, so yeah, before I actually get into talking about the pistons like properties itself, I will say I do like the Linux Red pistons, but they have their place in airsoft builds. They're not, in my opinion, you shouldn't use them in every build. The uh, the Linux Red piston is a piston made out of plastic. It has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten, I want to say. Yep, yes. ten <laughs> metal teeth made out of steel, and then the rest of these six are made out of plastic. Now, a lot of people when they upgrade pistons, they want to go full steel rack, which you know there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, at the same time, there's nothing wrong with having a plastic rack or a half plastic rack because people do that. People sometimes use plastic pickup tooth pistons in order to have a weak point in the gearbox. Like if you're running an M150 spring and you have like no fuse and running it on like a 14.8 volt LiPo and this is a full stroke you know, setup and you're running a Lonex red piston, you might want to consider a fail point because if something's going to fail in there, it might want to be something that is going to fail easily and not drastically explode like the gears will. So that's kind of the concept there. Whereas I don't necessarily agree with that concept because if you build something to fail, then in my opinion you're building it wrong. So that's that's my philosophy, I guess, and that could be a whole other topic. But uh, the Linux Red Piston is actually an incredibly tough piston for what it is. I'm not exactly aware of the um, material they use to construct it, but it is incredibly firm. And I have a vise right here, and whenever I put it into the vise, it takes actually a lot of force to get it to bow and to get it to uh, deform. So that being said, its structural integrity is very sound, and the piston teeth themselves can take a lot, I mean, I mean a lot of abuse before they actually wear out. This piston actually hit PME on an M110 at around 35 RPS in the plastic tooth region, and it did not break. It just scuffed it up a little. So that's pretty impressive if you ask me. Um, now the builds they should be used in though, is stuff like DMRs and uh, stuff that's going to have higher FPS because the Lonex piston does way more. And so when you're running high FPS setups, you want a piston that's heavier because you'll get more joules out of it. You'll get a more accurate, more stable BB and a higher FPS out of it. So that's the point of a Lonex Red Piston, in my opinion. Can they be used in high speed? Sure, but you're going to have to do a little bit more work to get it to work. So that's my take on it. Yeah, just more of the same, I guess. Uh, I agree with I think every single thing you said on the piston. I I own one for personal builds. Um, it was I bought it to use in my scar um, when it was a DMR. So just again, what Ryan said, they do have their place. I mean, it's a heavier, sturdier piston with more weight to it. More has a lot more mass than like your SHS 15 suits that everyone's used to buying the SHS blues, um, which I mean. I have used them in high-speed SSG setups before, but I've had to switch keys the freaking hell out of it because it's a lot heavier. And once you get up to the 40 RPS range and you still want to use an M120 spring or M130 short stroke, you really have to have a lightning piston, especially when you're going over that 40 RPS mark. And the Lonex Red, not that it can't get the job done, it's just not the most ideal for that situation. So you do have to modify it more than would for again like an SHS Blue for example um, and again to reiterate what Ryan said so I have I had the piston in my scar I'm currently going over a massive part swap in all my personal guns I think every single one of my personal guns even my HPA is going to be changed within the course of the next month um, and I'm swapping that piston into a jewel creep build that I am going to um, start pursuing and for my personal belief that the Lonex Red Pistons, I like them. I would definitely keep buying them and using them. Um, but where they are a heavier piston, if I buy it, I'm buying it because I need a heavier piston, not because I need a lightweight piston. I would buy a different one for that. So I would personally only use them in Jewel Creek or DMR type builds or maybe your standard field gun shooting under 30 RPS, 35 RPS max, like nothing insane. Um... And going off on a tangent a little bit, but the, the Lonex Blue Pistons, actually, the ones that are marketed to be a lighter red, I actually don't like those at all. So I've, I believe they use the exact same um, steel teeth rack. However, the blue material 
it's not just a less dense version of the red material. It's a completely different material, and it's it's really weak. I've had, I think I've used three of the blue pistons. One of them was a Bravo, but that's just the Lonex piston with the Bravo stamp on it. It's the same thing. Um, and all three of them stripped in the plastic teeth section without hitting PME on normal 30 round per second setups. Like, the M120, M130 spring max. Like, it was nothing too stressful at all. Um, stuff that like stock SEMA pistons and stock JG Cream pistons would keep up with fine without problems. And these pistons were consistently stripping. And I just stopped buying them because they were, I think, $20 a pop still for the um, blue pistons. And they just, they weren't that durable. However, the reds, I've never had a durability issue with them at all. So it's almost kind of backwards compatible. If you had a bad experience with the blue, don't judge the red that way because it is just a different piston. And I, it, durability wise for the, especially having the plastic teeth in the back I think it's like the last five teeth are plastic it's like because it has the one shaved off so it would be the six teeth um, spots um, they are a very durable material with being plastic and that does give your gun a failure point now uh, the one thing I have to say where I do disagree with what Ryan said is I, I agree that you should never build a gun to fail and I usually don't even make a failure point in my guns. However, I do see the argument people spring up, for example, a compression jam, which is something that you can't build to avoid. That's something that just happens when there's a malfunction in the system. Usually if something gets in the barrel and it clogs things up, and especially with guns shooting 35, 40 rounds per second, like the ones I often build, if there is a compression jam, um, Basically, what happens is that the air cannot cycle through your system, and it gets backed up. So when your piston tries to slam forward, there's still air from the previous shot. It hasn't expelled out the barrel yet, so it all builds up, and the piston gets caught, and the gears keep spinning, and the gears and the piston teeth hit each other. It's almost like hitting... P it basically is hitting PME, but in a different way. It's not that the piston return was too slow. It's that a compression jam kept the piston back, so the second gear could hit it. So in that instance... For example, you would want a failure point because I'd much rather replace a piston than having um, metal gear teeth go through all my gearbox and possibly ruin other pieces of the um, gearbox. But literally, and that's the only instance where I would ever condone making a failure point in your system. Right on. Um, yeah, I've actually I've gotten into, into debates with other techs about that, and. Um, I do see the point in it, but at the same time, and uh, this is like only my experience really, I've honestly never had a catastrophic, uh, oh, what's it called, compression jam. I've never had one that's just destroyed everything. No, and, I haven't either, but yeah, like, so, I've seen people who have had it, so it's not an unrealistic fear to have, I guess. Yeah. Um, but it's like, you know, you, you know Lefsey on Airsoft Society, right? Yeah. A while back, he used to talk about like the strength of the SHS piston, and uh, like I, I guess he still does. He, he, like, I'm trying to know your, yeah, didn't he yeah. say he had a compression jam at like 50 RPS in his SSG, and the, the SHS piston broke his sector or something like that? Yeah. The piston failing? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so like, I find that like really funny. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I do too, but it's like it's stories like that that bring to light. Like, sometimes it is worth having a failure point. Mm -hmm. But, like, again, there is two sides of the argument because I don't want to... At the same time, if I'm build, building a system with a failure point, that means naturally that point is going to degrade faster over time. Exactly. And naturally that point is going to eventually fail through normal use without a compression jam. So, like, there's really there are two sides of the debate. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, I need to build a gun where I just build it, like, out of, say, like a basic... 30 RPS setup, and I don't touch the insides at all until it breaks. That's what, mm -hmm. I, need, that's what I need to do. I need to isolate it to just, like, the piston and the gears and see what breaks first. Yeah. So, that, that'd, be a, that'd be another good topic for us to, you know, go on. But, uh, I'm afraid it's time for us to move on to our next topic, which is XT60 connectors versus Dean's connectors. And I'll let Ryan take this one since I had the previous one. Alright, um... So I personally use Dean's connectors, um, not necessarily because I think they're better in every way. However, they are more common than XT60s among other airsofters. So I know, for example, I am part of an airsoft team. I have a lot of friends at airsoft. If they need someone working their guns, I'm usually the first person they go to. 
and I just wire all their guns to Dean's, it's a lot easier. So if they do need an extra battery, all my batteries are already on Dean's, so it's easier to just kind of stay with that system. Is If I were on XT60s and they were all on Dean's, I wouldn't be able to help them. Um, but also in that regard, some people like the opposite. They like having their batteries wired to the other connector so that they can't um, let someone else borrow their stuff. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I love that. I love that one too. Times actually, but I feel like I'd be a little rude. I'm, I'm the only person that runs nicer lipo batteries for a while. I think my teammates are starting to get them, but um, until then, I was always the b b battery whore among my friends because everyone else would have the 8.4. Or 9.6 cycle amount of hydrates, and then I'll have a 14.8 volt lipo just sitting in my bag casually. Um, <laughs> but um, getting <laughs> more on like the actual connectors themselves, I also like Dean's connectors because they're not small. So when I wire guns um, to buffer tube lipos, I recently started wiring MOSFETs inside the gearbox shell. I didn't used to do that because I always had the fear that the um, glue you hold it down with and the pressure in the shell wouldn't be enough to hold the MOSFET in place, and Somehow, some way, the spur gear, the gear would just rape it. System. Yeah, so I always had that kind of thought in my head that it could happen, so I didn't want to put that in a customer's gun. And coming back two months later, that his gun, his, his battery caught on fire, and his gun wouldn't turn off full auto because he stripped his MOSFET or something like some stupid like that. Yeah, literally um, stripped his MOSFET. That would actually be what happened, guys. Because the, the spur <laughs> would just yeah, destroy it. Yeah, because the MOSFET it. has gears and teeth in it. No, but, um, yeah, I, I didn't. Basically, I didn't want to put it in a customer gun and have the customer have it fail on the customer because I was unaware that it could have failed that way. However, in my most recent build, I did, and it's working fine so far. I have no regrets. And it frees up a lot of space in the buffer tube to fit batteries. Um, and one of the reasons why I don't use XC60s is because where I usually wire things, the buffer tubes. Every company makes different specs for the buffer tubes, and sometimes especially where I used to put MOSFETs in the buffer tube as well, it just took up too much space, and it was kind of annoying. Um, or, for example, with, with a SCAR, so not an M4, where you actually have to fit the connector through various holes to get in the stock, or an ACR, where you need to fit it above the charging handle and through the bolt carrier into the handguard. Like, the X60 connectors were actually too big to fit in those spaces. So instead of dremeling the customer's gun, I just give them a smaller connector, and it all works fine. Yeah. Um, now, on the specs of the actual connector, I know there's a lot of rumors going around which one's better, which one's worse. Something that's really, really important to point out is that 90% of airsofters don't use actual Dean's connectors. They use clone Dean's, kind of like how in airsoft we have JG is like a clone company. They don't actually they copy the TM design and use their own cheaper, sturdier parts. They don't tune it as well to get it out there. Companies do that with everything, not just airsoft guns. So Dean's connectors, the legitimate ones, um, cost a lot more than the clone ones. So when you go to clandestine airsoft, for example, the XT gripped Dean's connectors, those aren't legitimate Dean's brand's connectors. Those are just Dean's connectors made by another company. So they're not as high quality. They're still much better than the T Tamiya connectors that come on like 99% of stock guns still just beyond me why they do that. It must be a little, a little cheaper. It saves them like a dollar per gun. Um, it's but, a standard. Boo. Yeah, you need to change the standard. Um, go GMP. They're the only ones doing that right now. But, um, so, so what I was getting at is you can't necessarily compare those Deans to XT60s because XT60 clones are not very popular at all right now and I think that's because the XT60 itself originated from like another China clone company. So, like, there's nothing to clone it right now. Um, and I know Hobby King, all their Turnigy lipos come with XC60s standard. Um, so it's really hard to kind of, like, compare the XT60 to the Dean's clone. However, if you compare it to a regular, actual, legitimate Dean's connector, I think the XT... I think that the Dean's has less resistance, and the XT60 allows slightly higher current flow... Yeah. If I if I'm remembering that right, I might be I, again. Even if I, I'm pulling that info from like a Hobby King forum, so I'm assuming that person that posted the info was right, which it could be wrong. I have not done the test myself, but from what I remember, the legitimate Deans and the legitimate XT60s for airsoft purposes in the current draw for airsoft guns, the legitimate Deans actually they're smaller and they have less resistance in them. The XT60s, however. 
Um, they're much easier to clip, they're much easier to take apart, they're much easier to solder, and they have slightly more resistance, but it's almost negligible, you know, like what we actually use in an airsoft gun. And then compared to the Dean's clones, the XT60s are better in every way, except they are bigger, and which is like what I talked about earlier. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty much on the same page with Ryan, again. Uh, Dean's, comparing Dean's and XT60s isn't like near just... It's almost preference, really. Um, personally, I prefer Deans, and I actually, I mean, I have reasons why I prefer Deans, obviously, but Ryan already said them. It's the small size of them. It's the fact that uh, that um, it's more of a standard in Airsoft, I guess you could say, because the current standard in Airsoft is Tamiya connectors, unfortunately, which... An upgrade standard would be like Deans. Yeah, an, an, an upgrade standard is Deans. So, like, an upgrade standard in Airsoft today for, like, motors is a Neo motor. Neodymium yeah. motor, not a you know uh, a brushless motor. That's not a standard. That'd be something like that. Probably one percent of the techs in this world have actually gotten to run properly. So it's not an upgrade standard then. But um, if you take a look at Dean's and XT60s, you get obvious differences, and um, like on the actual function of them, you get differences as well. Um, I believe Ryan is right when he's saying that the XT60s have more resistance but they can handle more of a load so they're better that's why hobby king sells them on most of their lipos because you know most lipos on hobby king believe it or not they're not bought for airsoft purposes they're <laughs> bought for like running rc tanks planes yeah. boats stuff that actually draws a lot of current not like you would think that an airsoft 40 amps is a lot of current no try like 200 amps in an rc car going like 95 miles an hour those things are sick, though. Yeah, that's, that is amps, not, not airsoft. So a lot of hobby enthusiasts don't understand airsoft because of that. They're like, oh, my RC car is, you know, 50 times more powerful than your airsoft gun, which is, a, which is true. But that's why they use XT60s instead of Deans. So Deans have a different purpose. So do XT60s. So they're kind of uncomparable. But um, a lot of hobby enthusiasts that, you know, would used to use RC cars and they get into airsoft, they automatically use XT60s because it's what they're familiar with. So that's just kind of what happens. So normally when somebody who, who uses XT60s, um, they're typically somebody who has been in the hobby before and uh, understands it more, and that's just what they've used before. So uh, that's kind of what I've noticed. People that use Tamiya connectors aren't in the know. People that use Deans are in the know. People that use XT60s are the no. So I mean, they're, they're the cool guys. Yeah, they're they're the cool minority. So that's the thing here. But Deans are kind of like what Ryan said, the upgrade standard. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much Deans versus XT60s. I figured that'd be an interesting topic to cover, considering they're almost, you know, uncomparable, but at the same time they draw parallels. So that's what I thought would be kind of cool. All right. Um, before we do head off here, I would like to do one more thing. I've, I get a ton, a ton, a ton of questions on my YouTube channel and Instagram. And so I figured it'd be kind of fun if Ryan and I addressed one. So I'm picking up this one on my, on my most recent Tech Talk Q&A by Ryan McMohan. I don't... It's another Ryan. Yeah, awesome. Ryan McMahon. I don't know how to pronounce your last name. I'm butchering it. I'm, I know how to pronounce your first name because... I have your first name. It's a beautiful name. It is a fantastic name. Um, all the texts have it. Um, so you're destined. And he asks, do you think that there will ever be lower ratio gears than 10 to 1? Like maybe an 8 to 1 TSG? TSG, no. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry to crush your hopes and dreams right now. It's just not practical from a, like, a mechanical standpoint. Like, I'm sure you can achieve it in some ridiculously insane stupid setup that we would have to go over and throw our minds together with everyone else in airsoft mechanics and kind of talk about it but honestly from a practical like airsoft standpoint of getting rounds down range and not just having a gun cycle i really don't think a tsg would be viable uh yeah addressing the tsg one first um because that's the one while we all got real fast sorry um, it's a cool concept but <laughs> yeah, it's just not happening i, I doubt it uh so with the TSG, you run into several problems. First problem, let's just let's just completely skip the fact that it's five tooth per side, and uh, yeah, and just move on to something else. So other than 150 FPS per shot. Yes, uh, because you can space an MS210 spring, right? Yeah, that too, and that doesn't put any extra wear on your gearbox shell at all. None, none at all. So the first problem you're gonna run into is feeding, and feeding 
getting that tackle plate to return in time and getting it to pull back far enough and getting the magazine to push a BB up in that chamber before it cycles is going to be near impossible. Now, if we were to run like solenoids, like polar stars do, and we can get it to feed like that and it reduces all the wear off the uh, tappet plate and all the feeding issues there, the mags probably wouldn't be able to keep up. And if we somehow get a mag to be able to keep up by like spacing the spring out, then we're only going to be getting like 70 rounds in the M4, you know, mid cap, and a TSG, if you want to really push some limits, is going to go around 100 RPS. So your gun's going to be shooting a higher RPS than your magazine even holds. You're going to have like a 0.7 second full auto range where you have to reload every single time. <laughs> exactly. So if you hold down that trigger for one second, you're going to burn through your magazine in less than one second. So it's not really RPS. Really, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> so and the, the, other thing, the other thing too is that very, very similar to having your tap it return forward, your spring has to return. So kind of like if you guys understand how a DSG works with the two separate gear, I'm assuming you do if you ask about it, a triple second gear. Um, the reason why you use heavier, a lot stiffer springs isn't in, half of it is because the FPS. You need to regain that FPS somehow. But the other half is because you need the, the um, piston to return twice as fast as it normally does because it has to be returned stationary before the sector gear teeth come to pick it up again or else you hit premature engagement. So now if you have a triple sector gear, it has to return about 75% faster, not just half as fast or twice as fast, like I, I'm only saying 275% as fast um, than it previously did, which means you'll have to literally use a spaced M M210 spring to maybe get it to return in time without hitting PME, and then even at that, you're still going to have 190 FPS, like max, 200 FPS maybe, it's really just impractical. Yeah, you'd um, have to shorten the barrel really short to accommodate for your under-voluming. And then yeah, that too. what Ryan's saying is you're going to just work. have so much premature engagement issues. Unfortunately, our issues lie in the upper portions of the gearbox. We've got mechanics down to the point where we can shim gear so perfectly to where that's not a problem. It's just the fact of keeping it all like on the same speed level. And so we're just not going to be able to return our piston in time, we're not going to be able to return the tappet in time, and that's going to do some massive modification to get these things rolling right. But uh, that's unfortunately probably not going to happen, though I would really love to get a TSG gear and just at least try it out. I would too, just for a, to say that I was able to make it cycle and not have the whole thing explode. Yeah. However, to go and use it, like, I mean, I I'm going to be shooting... It's just going to be so ridiculously underpowered that it's like it's going to have no purpose, really. Yeah. Now, see, if you could take like a 32 TPA motor, 18 to 1 TSG, you'd probably get uh, 40 RPS on 11 1 volt, which is pretty solid. Maybe, but, maybe uh, like 40, 50. So it's, it's really not going to be too much. Like, for example, I can do the same thing with a 22 TPA motor and get 40 RPS. So, like, there's really no advantage there. With a DSG, sorry, if I wasn't using the triple sector gear. In, hypothetical situation so I just don't see really a, a gain of using it other than saying like I made this work it's freaking cool yeah exactly so unfortunately probably not gonna happen but the next part of the question which is really interesting just you know lower than 10 to 1 ratio gears do you think that's possible um, that's interesting that's an interesting question because I've thought about it but um, if you take a look at the gearbox um. You just take a look at how the whole thing works. You can notice how Siege Tech makes their bevels larger, the lower teeth larger, and the spur smaller to make their ratio change. Now, if you look at the gearbox, you can tell that their 10 to 1 bevel almost touches the walls in the gearbox shell, the lower teeth. So you're not going to be able to change that much more. You're not really going to make it much lower unless you modify the shell. And that would be cutting into your wire channel, which probably wouldn't be a good idea. You can get around those pesky little wires. <laughs> You could. If you if you really like really wanted to, you could find a way to reroute them. It'd be really annoying and unnecessary, but there's just too many walls you're gonna bump into. Yeah. It's just not I don't think I think if somebody's gonna try. I mean, maybe SHS will be like, whoa, maybe we'll try something weird here, but I doubt it's going to happen because if they if SHS does it 
they'd have to change it between the spur and the sector. Yeah. And that would be interesting as well. So that is more practical. But it, will I see it happen? Probably not, because SHS is a clone company. They copy other people. So they don't really innovate. Yeah, look at that SHS DSG. <coughs> yeah, exactly. So if there would be a Siege Tech TSG, in five years expect an SHS TSG. Mm. And so that's basically what's going to happen. The, um, the other thing about that is I know before Riot and um, made the um, 10 to 1 gears, 13 to 1 was kind of like the industry standard for like the lowest ratio. If you want a stupid retail website like Airsoft DI, they were always a super high speed upgrade gears. And anywhere else, it was just SHS 13 to 1s. But I didn't really think it would get much lower than that. And then the 10 to 1s came out. So right now, I don't think it's going to get much lower than that. But there's always a chance that someone comes out with 8 to 1s, for example, or 9 to 1s. Or even now, how people are selling 12 to 1 ratio gears, where there's no different, like, there's their output, for example, SHS manufactures 12 to 1 and 30 to 1 ratio gear still. It's not just that they relabeled the ratio, like, they still make both, and there's hardly any, I, I haven't noticed a difference with either, I've used both of them. Um, so, for the company to make 9 to 1 ratio gear, just to kind of say we have the lowest ratio, I don't think it's possible. Um, but again, as you get lower and lower, I don't know how practical it will be, because eventually there's a point where only the, the lower ratio you get, the higher torque motor you need to pull it efficiently. And because it puts more strain on the motor, that's just naturally how the mechanical system works. Especially if you're using a system where you don't have an M100 spring, for example. Let's say you have an M140 spring. Not high stress, but decent stress. And you have a stock motor. So the best way to illustrate this is with LP upgrade parts we have right now, with maybe some stock parts. If you ever own a combat machine M4 and you replace the spring with an M140 and the gears with 13 to 1s, you would notice that the motor can no longer pull your gun. It just doesn't work. Um, of course, I can probably plug in a, a high-powered battery and get it to kind of struggle over until the motor burns out, because those motors suck, asshole. But, to lead him topic, um, it just doesn't work. There's too much strain on the gearbox. And what you'll notice is that if you change those gear ratios up to maybe a 32 to 1 torque set, it would be able to pull it very, very slowly, but it would be able to pull it, because that's what the ratio in gears is. It's distribution of torque and force. If the gears take a lot longer to turn, they're easier to turn. If the gear ratio is a lot smaller, they turn quicker cycle and make them turn. So, do I think it can get lower? Sure, why not? I thought 13 was going to be the limit. So you check moving wrong and made 10 to 1s. Um, do I think it's necessarily going to get more and more practical the farther we go down? Probably not. Yeah, um, there's a thing I've been always thinking about, and I th starting, I'm starting to feel like airsoft mechanics in general, like the way the gearbox works and the way the hop-up unit and barrel and all that stuff works, we're almost reaching the point to where we've hit the limit, almost. I mean, I'm, I know there's always that, you know, slight improvement that can be made, there's always an invention that's going to come out that makes something better, but I, I'm, I'm starting to feel like we've reached the point where we've almost completely perfected how the whole system works. And so, I know we don't, we don't have like a camera inside the gearbox to scientifically say we do, but at the same time, we can make such accurate predictions on rate of fire and how things are going to break and wear out and what our range and accuracy and RPS is going to be that you know we've almost completely li almost literally become one with the way the gun works which is really really cool and so and I'm not saying there's not going to be anything new on the market for parts because there's always going to be something new there will always be that's not something that you can you know shoot down but we're almost reaching the point of practicality so that's kind of the point there and TSG and lower than 10 to 1 gears, they just mechanically are not practical. 18, I mean, 8 to 1 gears, sure, they're practical, but there's just going to be things you're going to change and make up to get it to work. Like Ryan says, you're going to need a stronger motor. Well, we have 32 TPA motors. Those, those work just fine. Those can pull any spring on any setup possible. So they, they'll pull 8 to 1 gears easily. I, I bet they will. Um, but what's the point in doing that over something else that we currently have? So, is there a big enough demand for 8 to 1 gears to exist? So that's kind of the whole concept there. And um, with the 13 to 1 versus 12 to 1 gears, that's, a, that's interesting because there's only one, you know, 
like one part ratio smaller than the other one. So 13 to 1 gears are actually not 13.000 repeating one like to one gears. They're actually 13.65 to one gears. 12 to 1 are 12.45 to 1, I believe. That, I believe that's correct on those. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're right. Yeah, so they're not exactly 12 to 1 because, well, can't be exact uh, half the time because of repetition and mathematics. It just doesn't work like that. So, same thing with 10 to 1s. They're actually 10.44 to 1s. And 14 to 1, I think they're like 14, 3 something to 1. And so that's just that's just how it is actually. But people have you know rounded up or down to thirteen to one or twelve to one. And so you know that's perfectly fine because that point six five is almost you know negligible. It's almost so it's kind of not a point. And that's why twelve to one versus thirteen to one you're not going to see a difference because well the RPS difference is you know almost completely negligible. So no point there and almost so yeah. But yeah, I just figured that'd be a nice question to answer, so. Alright. Well, this will bring an end to the first epi- or not the- Dang it, it's not the first, is it? It's <laughs> the first like the in first. it feels- it's the first in a long, long time. Yeah, because a big break. Yeah, we took, I took a huge break, and Ryan's been busy, and Ryan, me, has been busy, so. We've been- <laughs> Both Ryan's. We've been really busy, guys. But, uh, yeah. I'm so happy that this is getting back on, and I'm, I hope everybody enjoys it. These will be uploaded to YouTube because on SoundCloud a lot of people don't have it, and I'm not as well known on SoundCloud as I am on YouTube. You know, I'm not well known on YouTube either, but you know, sad face. Oh, well. <laughs> You're getting there. I'm getting there. I have 1,700 something subs, and I'm counting every one. Uh, see, you already passed me, so you're you're doing fine. Yeah, well, I mean, I make videos, so. <laughs> True. Pod shot, pod shot, but oh well. <laughs> But uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this. I enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. Um, we, we're going to try to do it once a week. And I'm going to have Ryan on here every single week. So he's actually going to be more of a co-host. And so he'll be bringing topics. I'll, I'll be bringing topics. It won't be just you know me. It'll be him and me. And so, yeah, we're going to have a lot of fun, answer questions, discuss topics, and potentially have debates because those are always fun. Those are the best. So I'll see you guys later. Uh, do you have anything you want to add in, Ryan? Um, not really, so I guess to respond to that jab you threw at me, I, I am trying to make more videos actually, so I go, to, I'm still in high school, but I go to a boarding school, so a lot of the time I have during the day is completely swallowed up, however, I am officially out of school for the summer, so I'm hoping to get some gameplay videos of the Spring Offensive 7 off in Massachusetts, I just went to a gear review of my channel soon, and I am undergoing five new builds for my guns and another customer build so i'm hoping that i will be able to counter ryan's point and start cranking out some videos on my youtube channel i want to see ryan get bigger on youtube because he deserves it he's always been a great tech so him and i have been teching together for like a long time because we right, we, we basically yeah we, we basically grew years. up on the forums together so we were like learning stuff all the time be like dude did you know this oh man did you know that it was pretty great yeah. We were we were pretty stupid back then, but it was, it was fun to learn everything together. With I think you, uh, I was in the forum for like a year. Then you, then I I met you through the forum. I met Charlie through the forum. I met a lot of more a lot of guys that were already knowledgeable to help bring me up. And then I learned my own way, kind of reading other things and doing my own testing. But it was it's it's fun. I remember the first podcast podcast when you contacted me to ask if you wanted to do it. I was like ecstatic because I hadn't talked to you really in a really really long time and it was just fun to kind of go back to how, the way we used to we, we, we learned on the forum together basically so I know that's where I started tech and I think that's n maybe not where you started but I know like early, in your early stages we were both there together so it was fun it was increasing it was incredibly fun and I'm wanting to recreate that fun here and bring back some nostalgia <laughs> and uh, not just talk about the halcyon days of yore but you know actually further our discussions and learn so like I said, that'll have to do it for this episode, but stay tuned for next week because we're going to be back again, and we'll have more topics to discuss, and we'll uh, hopefully have something to debate about make it really interesting because we agree a lot, and that's not necessarily a problem, but debates are fun. Yeah. So thank you guys for listening to this podcast. It's definitely over 30 minutes, but oops. Um, we tried. We tried. We, but we, we really did. We, we talked too much, but we've been told people like to listen to us.